This episode of Lex Out Loud is brought to you by the patrons of Starwalker Studios. Learn how you can support the show at LexStarWalker.com slash support. Hello and welcome to episode 37 of Lex Out Loud, writing science fiction. I'm your host, Lex Starwalker. This is a podcast for writers, readers, and all lovers of speculative fiction. I'm writing my third novel and taking you along for the ride. Today, I'm going to go over some of the options for the point of view of a story. I'll explain why you generally want to avoid the quote, weird ones, They usually get in the way of the reader understanding and enjoying the story. However, occasionally a less common point of view will enhance a reader's immersion in the story. And if you can pull it off flawlessly, it can take your story to the next level. So welcome back, everyone. So glad that you joined me for another episode of the show. At the beginning of the show, I, I like to tell you what I'm uh, consuming as, as far as uh, entertainment that, that maybe is uh, inspirational or, or just cool and enjoyable. I just finished reading the book Project Hail Mary by Andy Weir, and I loved it. I was hooked from the first page. It was an amazing read, and I really enjoyed it, and I highly recommend it to you. And uh, in my mind, it's it's hard sci-fi done right. I think it's it's pretty approachable for for anyone to read. And uh, yeah, it is. I think hard sci-fi. I mean, I don't know what the official word on that is, but uh, that's that's what I would consider it. And it's uh, it's really well written. I've read some good hard sci-fi in the past, but but most of it that I liked had like really cool ideas and cool things happened, but. Um, wasn't so well written and the characters weren't believable or weren't um, three-dimensional or or whatever but this is a, a well-written story and and yeah I was I was hooked through it in fact I read the thing in like two days I can't remember the last time I read a novel that fast I just could not put it down and I just looked forward to every moment that I could spend reading it and I really enjoyed it I highly recommend it uh, I do recommend that you just read it. Don't go find reviews of it or anything like that, because unfortunately, a lot of people who review books can't seem to do so without spoiling the book in the process. And and this is one of those stories where you really want to go into it as blind as possible. You know, even someone well-meaning not trying to spoil it could spoil things for you because a big part of the enjoyment of this book is learning things as you go. And so... I've heard other people say this too. It's it's just not a story you can really say much about without spoiling some of the the fun surprises. So I'll just say it's good and I recommend it and and you should check it out. I'm actually going to be talking a bit about that book today in a non-spoiler way as an example of a book that uses what I consider to be a weird point of view and does it well and does it I think for the for the right reasons. So like I said, I finished that in like two or three days and I just started reading another book by Andy Weir called Artemis and and I'm only like a chapter into that. I just started that uh, last night. So that's what I'm reading right now. All right. So I know I said that last week I was going to do something different for this episode, but I lied. (laughs) No, seriously, I I was going to try to do something special for my birthday, which is coming up uh, here this week. But uh you know, I thought I'd try to celebrate a year of the show because it's been about a year since I started planning and producing the show and also to celebrate another trip around the sun for me. But I tried writing that episode and just really couldn't come up with much to say. So instead, I, I thought I'd talk about this today. So so I'm going to talk about point of view and tense. And actually, the initial idea for this topic comes courtesy of our patron and listener, Helga who submitted a question for the future AMA on this topic. And and I was planning to cover that in the next AMA. But uh, especially after reading Project Hail Mary, I I realized that I had enough to say about this to easily fill an episode. And hopefully this episode won't be too long. 
but it is going to be a little longer because I do want to define some terms here at the beginning because I know that a lot of you actually that listen to this show are not writers, um, which is awesome. <laughs> You're all welcome. So I don't want to just assume that everybody, that we're all on the same page when I use some of these grammatical and, and writing terms. So I do want to take a little bit of time here at the beginning just to kind of lay everything out for everyone. So we're all on the same page and you know what I mean by certain things. So the question that Helga asked that kind of spurred this episode is what tense perspective and narrative distances do you enjoy reading and writing? Um, so that's kind of the seed that this episode has grown from. So as I said, I want to start off just by uh, defining some terms so we're all on the same page. I, I did not look up dictionary definitions of these terms. These are just my understandings. So this may not all be textbook perfect, but it, it'll get us all on the same page. And, and of course, if you want to learn more, uh, there's plenty of information out there on the internet that you can find about all this stuff. You know, go to Google or Wikipedia or wherever you want to go and, and start typing in terms and, and you can find everything you want to know and more. So the first thing I want to um, talk about is point of view. So in the context of, of this conversation today, what I mean by point of view is it can refer to either first person, second person, or third person. Point of view simply refers to who is telling us the story. Whose head are we in during the story? From whose perspective are we experiencing the story from? So most adult fiction, at least genre fiction, which is mainly what I read these days, is written in third person point of view. So I thought the easiest way to illustrate this for those of you that, that may be foggy on these terms is just to give you examples of each. So here's an example of third person. Lex began writing his next podcast episode, hoping this time he'd manage not to stick his foot in his mouth. So that's third person. Signposts for third person are use of the point of view character's name, in this case, Lex, and pronouns like he, she, they, etc. So that's third person. First person point of view is the next most common point of view that you'll see in adult fiction. You also see a lot of first person point of view in young adult fiction or YA. Um, I think it's actually the most common point of view in YA, but I, I could be wrong about that. I haven't crunched numbers or anything, but it seems like Pretty much every YA book I've read has been in first person. So here's an example of the same. I'm going to use the same sentence every time to, to help illustrate this. So here's the same sentence in first person. I began writing my next podcast episode, hoping this time I'd manage not to stick my foot in my mouth. Signposts of first person is we don't see the point of view character's name unless the name is used by usually another character in dialogue. The narrator of the story, the POV character, the point of view character, doesn't use the POV character's name. Instead, you will see pronouns like I, we, us, etc. So first person. Second person is an odd one. And you won't see this much, but you will see it, especially um, if you go a bit beyond the most popular things that are out there. But even some of the popular things you'll see might be written in a second person point of view. Now, there are some places where you, where you will see second person a lot, and I tried to think of some. So the textbook example of the second person point of view is the choose your own adventure stories. Um, I don't know if they still write those or if that's a thing of the past, but if, if you're around my age, you probably know what those are. So those were written in second person. Also, if you play tabletop role playing games, the read aloud text that's given for you to read to the players is usually in second person point of view. Other possibilities are a travel guide or something like that. So other than those specific instances where second person is what's used, it's usually not a good choice. So here's that same sentence again in second person. You began writing your next podcast episode, hoping this time you'd manage not to stick your foot in your mouth. So first of all, you see how awkward that is just to read or listen to or, or say also notice how the main character now is no longer Lex. It's the reader. It's you 
whoever that is, who knows who's reading that at any given time, but that's the character of the story. Where in the first two examples, the, the character of the story was Lex, me, not you. So that right there is one reason why it's usually a bad idea to use second person, other than, like I said, those, those uh, exceptions where it is what's used, um, but none of those are fiction. And the reason why this is a bad idea is because you don't know who the reader is. So how can you make accurate statements about them? For example, imagine a line in our story that said, you've always liked dogs, but you would never have one in your house. Now, if that's true for the person reading the story, maybe that's fine. But what if it's not true? It can't be true for every reader, right? So, so just by putting that line in your story, you're guaranteeing that there are going to be some readers whose reaction to reading that are going to be, I don't feel that way. That's not true about me. You can't tell me who I am. <laughs> so this point of view tends to kick the reader out of the story. And this is the very last thing you want as a fiction writer. So that's why I often consider these what I call weird point of views and tenses. I often consider them pretentious, show-off points of view. They don't serve the story. They don't serve the reader. They actually usually make the story worse and make it harder for the reader to understand what's going on, or at the very least, disrupt the reader's immersion in the story because they're constantly questioning these things you're telling them about themselves that aren't true. So if something you're doing as a writer doesn't help the reader understand what's going on, then it's making it harder to understand, right? These points of view are often used, I think, because the writer is trying to show off or impress. And it usually accomplishes the opposite. Okay, so that's point of view. First person, third person, or if you hate your reader, second person. Oh, and I guess I forgot to mention the, the hallmark or signpost for second person is the pronoun you. And it's really the only one you can use. Now, again, with second person, there are times when it's appropriate, like the examples I gave. This is the point of view you use in RPG read aloud text with present tense. For instance, you walk into a dark room that smells of moss. And in this situation, it makes sense because you're reading that to the players and describing what they see. And usually if you're good at writing read aloud text in an RPG, you're not telling the players what they think or what they feel because again, that's their choice. You don't know what they're thinking or feeling. Um, you're instead just telling them what they're experiencing, what they're seeing, what they're hearing, things like that, that are concrete. You know, this is what, this is what you experience. There's no room for interpretation. But obviously in a story, not read aloud text in, in an adventure, but in a story, you know, it's not going to be a very good story if you just say what the character is seeing and you know what their five senses are bringing in and you're not at all telling the reader what the character is thinking or feeling but as soon as you start telling the reader what the character is thinking or feeling in second person the character is the reader so you're going to run into problems okay so that's all point of view first person second person third person and again for the most part you're going to be using either first person or third person and for the most part that's what you're going to be reading uh, when you read books or stories so then the, the other side of this is the tense of the story. So the tense refers to when is the story taking place? Are we being told a story that already happened, past tense? Or are we telling a story that's happening right now, present tense? Or God forbid, are we trying to tell a story about something that hasn't happened yet, future tense? Now, I'm sure there are examples out there of things written in future tense, but it's even more rare, I think, than, than second person point of view. So you're rarely going to see that. So you can combine any tense with any point of view. So both of the examples I gave above, or, or I guess all three of the examples I gave above, uh, were in past tense. But I'll give them all here so you can compare and contrast. So let's start with third person. So here's third person past tense. Lex began writing his next podcast episode, hoping this time he'd manage not to stick his foot in his mouth. So it's third person because we're talking about Lex and we're using he and his. And it's past tense because the verbs are began, he would manage. So it's all in past tense. We're, we're talking about a story that's already happened. Another possibility would be third person present. Lex begins writing his next podcast episode, hoping this time he manages not to stick his foot in his mouth. So again, it's third person. Our, our nouns are Lex, he, his. 
But now we're in present tense. So our verbs are begins instead of began. It's happening now. It didn't already happen. And manages instead of he would manage. Um, so, okay, I'm not going to get into nitty gritty of different tenses, but, um, but you get the idea. And I'm not even going to mess with future tense here. Like I said, you're going to rarely see it because it's super awkward and weird. And I don't want to make things more confusing in this episode than they have to be. So there's third person past, third person present. Now let's try first person. So here's first person past. I began writing my next podcast episode, hoping this time I'd manage not to stick my foot in my mouth. So here it's first person. So instead of Lex, it's I, or instead of he or his, it's I or mine. And it's past tense because I say I began writing. So, so we're talking about something that's already happened. Here's first person present. I begin writing my next podcast episode, hoping this time I manage not to stick my foot in my mouth. So again, first person, we're using I, um, but now we're in the present tense. This is happening as we're reading it. It's happening right now. So I begin instead of I began. So just for uh, completeness, let, let's try this with second person. So here's second person past, which is uh, the example I gave before. You began writing your next podcast episode, hoping this time you'd manage not to stick your foot in your mouth. So again, second person, our subject is you, and we're in the past, you began writing. We're talking about something that, that you did a while ago, you did in the past. So here's second person present. You begin writing your next podcast episode, hoping this time you manage not to stick your foot in your mouth. So again, second person, we're using you, and it's in the present, you begin. So this is something happening right now. Now, I will point out here that second person is actually the one case where I think the present tense is actually better than the past tense. So when you're talking about first or third person, using past tense is for, far more common. And usually I think is the right choice. Because if you think about it, I mean, if you're telling someone a story, kind of by definition, the thing has already happened, right? Unless you are somehow narrating what's happening to you in real time, which other than than a few really edge cases, which which would work in science fiction, some of these edge cases. Um, but other than those, I mean, usually it's hard to imagine how you could be telling a story as it's happening. How would that even work, right? Usually by nature, a story is a tale of something that's already happened. So usually uh, with first and third person anyway, past is is where you want to be. And it's it's the most common tense that you'll see. But with second person, just because second person is so weird, if you're actually going to write a story in second person, personally, I just feel like present tense just reads a little bit better. It, it seems to make a little more sense than the past. So just to kind of wrap up that little bit, you have your point of view, which is either first, second, or third person, and just refers to who is telling the story. Is the person telling the story the main character or are they someone else or are they somehow the reader? <laughs> Which, anyway, I'm going to quit harping on why second person doesn't make a lot of sense, but I'm sure you've got it. And then there's tense, which could either be past, present, or or even possibly future. Um, but, but we're not really going to go in the future because it's just really bizarre. And if you want to, as an exercise, you could rewrite some of these examples in, in future tense and, and see how bizarre they are. But uh, this is already going to be really long and, and might be confusing in an audio format. So, so I don't want to muddy the waters with something that you're almost never going to see. Unless you're an editor reading slush pile stuff, in, in which case maybe you'd see it more. But if you're reading published stuff, you're not going to see future tense much, if ever. All right. So there's one other aspect when it comes to third person, at least. And that is the limited versus omniscient point of view. So these are both different types of the third person point of view. So again, this is getting at whose head are we in during the story? Whose perspective are we experiencing the story from? In a third person limited point of view, which is usually what you're going to see these days, we are in one specific character's head at any given time. You'll either have one point of view character for the entire book, or you might have more than one point of view character. But when you do have more than one point of view character in the book, usually the change between your point of view will happen between chapters. 
So um, to use The Wheel of Time, for example, that book has a lot of different point of view characters, but it's still third person limited because at any given time, we're only in one character's head. We only know what one character is thinking. So chapter one might be written from the point of view of Rand. So during that chapter, we're experiencing the story from Rand's point of view. We're, we're in Rand's head with Rand. We know what Rand is thinking. We know what Rand is feeling. But we don't know what any of the other characters are thinking or feeling. All we know is what Rand knows. So you might see something like Egwene seemed angry because Rand is using her body language to deduce that she's angry. But we can't say Egwene was angry because we don't really know what Egwene is feeling or thinking because we're in Rand's head unless there's some kind of weird magic going on where he's reading her mind. So that's third person limited. And then maybe in chapter two, now we're in Egwene's head. So in chapter two, now we're in Egwene's head and we know what Egwene is thinking and we know what she's feeling, but we don't know what anyone else is thinking or feeling. All we know is what Egwene knows. So we might get cues from other characters' body language as far as what Egwene thinks they're thinking or feeling, but we don't know for sure. So that's third person limited. You're always in one character's head at a time. And usually you will change points of view between chapters. So you will be in a given character's head for an entire chapter. Now, occasionally you will see a point of view change within a chapter in third person limited. And when that happens, that will be signified by a line break. So there'll be an empty space between two paragraphs when you change point of view characters. But really the best way to do it is between chapters if you can. That, that really eliminates... Uh, the chance of the reader getting confused. Now you will, unfortunately, occasionally in published works, see what is called point of view violations. And this is basically where the writer screws this up. So, you know, ideally you, you should never see this in a professionally published book because it is a mistake. It is a screw up. And it's very confusing to the reader when it happens. But sometimes these slip past the editor somehow. So a point of view violation is when you're writing a story in third person limited and the point of view character suddenly changes in the middle of a paragraph or even worse and more rare in the middle of a sentence. So if you've ever noticed this in a book, you know what I'm talking about because it kicks you right out of the story as you're trying to figure out what's going on. You're like, wait, wait a minute. I was in Rand's head and now I'm in Egwene's head. And that's actually a bad example because that never happened in the wheel of time because Robert Jordan was a master of third person limited and, and he would never make such an amateurish mistake. But uh, it does unfortunately happen in, in other books sometimes. So that's third person limited. The, the other option here is third person omniscient, which is where you do not just stay in one person's head. You can jump around whenever you want. This is a point of view that used to be more common in the past. You don't see it so much anymore, probably for good reason, because it can get really confusing really fast when you're jumping between heads like this, unless it's done in the hands of someone who's really skilled at it. A lot of times people will actually confuse what's in reality a point of view violation for being omniscient. They'll, they'll say, oh, you know, the story is omniscient. And it's really not. It's third person limited. It's just the writer is screwing up and making it seem at times like it's omniscient. The easy way to tell the difference is if a story is omniscient, the whole thing's going to be omniscient, or at least a whole chapter or section of the book will be. It's not going to switch between limited and omniscient willy-nilly, just wherever. If it's mostly in third person limited and just suddenly seems to be omniscient for a few sentences and now it's back to limited, that's a point of view violation. That's a mistake. That should that should have been fixed. Now, there are reasons that you might choose to use first person versus third person. There are kind of pros and cons to both, but I'm not going to go into that today because that's a whole nother can of worms. And also, as I said, with some specific exceptions, generally it's just best to avoid second person. But there, but there might be reasons um, that people would think they should use that as well. But again, that's a, another topic. So personally, to get back to Helga's question that, that spurred this whole thing off, what do I prefer, both as a reader and a writer? Personally, I prefer third person limited past tense for both reading and writing. That's that's where it's at for me. Um, I can get in the first person, uh, especially past tense, if it's well written and a good story. 
but it's not my favorite. And I've read a lot of good books that are in first person. Um, Andy Weir's uh, Project Hail Mary that we're going to talk about in a little bit is is in first person. And, you know, a lot of YA is in first person. The Harry Potter books, if I remember right, it's been a long time, but the Harry Potter books are not first person. They are in third person limited. But the Twilight books were in first person. Yeah, a lot of YA books are in first person. Sorry, I don't read YA, so I can't really give you examples beyond that. So my favorite is third person limited. And, you know, first person won't turn me off to a book. If a book's in first person, I'll read it and enjoy it. And and the nice thing about these, all of these, except for the really weird ones, is even if it's not your favorite, if it's written well, um, once you get a ways in the book, you kind of forget about it. You just get used to it. You know, if you really like third person limited and you really don't like first person, but you start right reading a book that's first person and it's well written, probably by the second or third chapter, you're not even noticing that it's first person anymore. You get used to it. I'm not a huge fan of third person omniscient myself, but I can get into it when it's well done, especially if it's just certain areas of a, of a book that are omniscient. So all that said, I really do dislike reading the other tenses and point of views. I, I don't like reading any kind of second person. I usually don't care for first person present or third person present. Yeah, and definitely not anything in future tense. I, I don't really want to read. So at this point, you know, I'm making a lot of uh, value judgments here, right? So I, I should uh, state and be clear here. Um, because not everybody's going to necessarily agree with this, and, and it might depend on what you're writing. Um, I know that people who, well, I shouldn't say I know, but I, I suspect or think that that some people at least who write you know, literary fiction may disagree with, with some of what I'm about to say. But I, but I think most people at least that write genre fiction and popular fiction uh, would agree with what I'm about to say which is that I am very much of the school of thought and the philosophy that good prose should be invisible. The story and the characters and sometimes the setting should take center stage, should be what the reader's attention are focused on, not the actual writing. Your job as a novel writer isn't to impress the reader with your writing or how smart you are or how clever you can be with the English language. You know, if that's what you're after, maybe try poetry. That seems like a better fit for that kind of thing. I don't know. I'm not a poet. But rather, as a novel writer, your job is to tell us a story and to get that story across to the reader as clearly, vividly, evocatively, and effortlessly as possible. At least if you want people to enjoy reading your book, that is. You know, so if your goal as a novel writer is I want to tell a good story and I want as many people as possible who read my story to enjoy it and to get sucked in by it, not be able to put it down and, and get a lot out of it, then you want your prose to be invisible. You don't want it to get in the way of the story and the characters. The story and the characters are what going to make the reader love your story, not your prose. Now, that's not to say that good prose doesn't have a place. It definitely does. But good prose in this context usually tends to be um, still invisible, but what makes it so good is is word choice and choosing really good nouns and verbs that really are evocative and, and really communicate exactly what you're trying to communicate. You're making the writing as concise as possible. You're conveying an idea in as few of words as possible. You're avoiding a lot of adverbs and adjectives. So, you know, when people talk about really good prose and fiction, that's usually what they're talking about. They're not talking about super pretentious writing that leaves the reader confused or um, you feel like you have to decode it. So in my opinion, anything other than third person limited past tense or first person past tense is not going to be what the reader expects, is not what they're used to reading. And so by definition, those other points of view and tenses are going to be the opposite of invisible prose because they're going to seem strange to the reader and they're going to stand out because they're not used to it. You know, so this isn't necessarily in some of these cases a thing of it's not as good. It's more a thing of what is the reader used to? What, what's going to be accessible to them? You know, first person 
present tense isn't necessarily worse in any measurable way than first person past tense. And and you can definitely make some arguments for why it might be the better thing for a given story, but it is less common. So as soon as you decide to use first person present, there are going to be readers that are going to be confused by that because they're not used to reading it. So that is going against your prose being invisible, which is not to say that it's the wrong choice necessarily, but it is something that you want to do for good reason, not just because you feel like it. So these weird tenses or points of view can be prose that call attention to itself and distracts the reader or even worse, confuses them. So a writer should only do something like that when he or she is, has a very good reason and even then only if he or she can pull it off exceedingly well. In almost every example I've read of these weird points of view, this is not the case. And it's a detriment to the story. The story is worse off. Either it didn't need to be told that way, it could have been told with first person past tense, or it could have been told with third person limited and been as good or better. Or maybe that was the right, maybe possible tense for the book or the point of view, but the writer just isn't that great at it, so it doesn't work. So like I said, most times that I've read something that I would call a weird point of view or tense, it did not serve the story. It did not work out well, either because it just wasn't the right choice or because the writer just didn't have the skills to pull it off well. So all of my novels that I've written so far have been third person limited because that's most of the stuff I've read through my life. That's what it's been. So that's what I have the most experience with as a reader. Um, that's also what is the most common right now. And it's as a writer, you know, you're, you're going to be naturally better at writing things that you have a lot of experience reading than you will be with, with things that you don't. You know, for example, if, you know, you're someone who your whole life you've only read, say, fantasy, and you decide you want to start writing sci-fi and you ask other writers, what should I do? The first thing they're going to tell you is read a bunch of sci-fi. You know, how, how can you write sci-fi if you've never read any sci-fi? So the same thing comes with points of view. You know, if you've only read third person and you want to write a story in first person, well, the first thing you should do is go read a bunch of stories in first person so that you can get that kind of intuitive grasp of how first person works. Because until you do that, you know, your chances of pulling it off well are, are not great. So like I said, so far the, the novels I've written have been in third person limited. I would consider doing a first person story if the story demanded it. And actually the book I'm writing right now, I considered it and I still occasionally consider it because I'm trying very hard to write the entire book from one point of view. So that lends itself more easily to being in first person if I'm only going to have one point of view, which you can have a first person book that has different points of view. Um, but then you have to do it between chapters when you switch. But um, I'm not a fan of that. I've read some books like that and I, I've never really been a big fan of it. And you have to be really good to pull that off because, you know, ideally those different characters are very different when you're in each one's head. And that's that's really hard to do convincingly. It's It's hard enough in third person limited. I think it's even harder in first person. So most often when you read first person, you'll have one point of view for the, the whole book. So just the fact that, that my current book, I'm planning to only have one point of view makes me wonder maybe first person would be a better fit for this. And ultimately I decided to go with third person limited basically for two reasons. First of all, I don't think first person would necessarily be a better fit. I think it would probably be just as good, um, but it wouldn't be better and so that kind of makes me lean towards third person limited because it's more common. It's more what people are used to. So why choose something that's a little less common and they're less used to it? It's less friendly to the reader when it's not inherently going to be better. Why would I do that? And then the second reason is, well, since it isn't going to be inherently better with first person, I should write third person limited because it's what I'm more comfortable with. It's what I have more experience with. I'm sure I'm better at it than I would be at writing first person. So again, if I decided right now to write it in first person, the reason would probably be more like I want to learn to write first person better or I want to try writing first person, neither of which 
is considering the reader, right? Those are selfish reasons. Um, they're, they're not chosen to make the story a better experience for the reader, which is why you should make choices like that. Not, not what will be better for you, but what's going to be better for the reader. So yeah, at least right now I'm, I'm pretty solid. It's going to be third person limited because I don't have a good reason to do otherwise. So if you're writing adult fiction, you should probably just default to third person limited past tense. Unless, again, you have a really good reason to do otherwise. That should just be your default assumption because that's what people are most used to. That's what will be the most invisible. If, on the other hand, you're writing YA, young adult, you should probably default to first person past tense because that's what most YA is. And that will be the most invisible. So if you're considering a point of view other than those, ask yourself, does the story really need to be told that way? Is it really going to add to the story or is it going to take away from it and frustrate and or annoy the reader? Okay, and after you answer that question, if you're still considering this other point of view, also ask yourself, do I really have the skill to pull this off well enough that it won't be a train wreck or it won't make the story less good than it would have if I would have chosen a point of view that I'm, that I'm better at and that's more common? So you notice here I'm making another assumption. I am making the assumption that the point of view that you're better at writing will be the point of view that's more popular. And the reason I'm making that assumption is because most likely, unless you went out looking for weird points of view to read, most likely most of the stuff you've read through your life will be one of the more popular points of view. So just um, the nature of, of how we learn writing you're going to be better at writing the points of view that you've read the most because there's so much to writing and, and good writing that is hard to or even impossible to explain or teach to people. You can only learn it through reading a lot and just kind of doing enough homework and enough reading that you get this just internal intuition of what sounds right or what sounds good. And there are so many things that you just can't teach that are just too subtle or they're too situational that you can't teach them to people. You can only learn it by reading a lot. So, you know, if you read a lot of first person past tense and that's most of what you read or have read, that's probably going to be the point of view that you're best at writing. So again, if you are wanting to go outside of that, you know, maybe... Okay, here's just an example off the top of my head. Maybe you read a lot as a as a teenager, as a young adult, and you read all YA and and maybe 98% of the YA you read was in first person. But now you're an adult and you want to write adult fiction and you want to write in third person, but you've read very few books that are actually in third person. The best advice for you probably at that point would be read a bunch of stuff in third person because right now you, you probably have a really good intuitive grasp of what good first person looks like and you could probably write really good first person, but you don't yet have that grasp of third person because you haven't read enough of it yet. All right, so, so now that we've <laughs> spent the good part of the show getting on the same page of what all these things mean. And, and hopefully you're all with me now. Let's talk about Project Hail Mary. So there is a really important rule in writing that you've probably heard before. A lot of people will say it's the most important rule. And also as a side note, this is also a rule in music. The same rule exists in music. And I suspect that maybe it exists in every art form. My, my wife is a, a visual artist. She does painting and drawing. And, and she says this is a thing with that too. So I, I have a feeling it's the case with any creative art. But the rule is, if you know what you're doing, and if you're skilled enough to pull it off very well, and knowledgeable enough to know when to do it and when not to do it, you can break the rules. And some of the best books out there have broken rules that the rest of us should really be following. So yeah, once, once you're a master, um, you can break the rules because you'll know when and how to do it um, to get the right effect. So I wouldn't go so far as to say that avoiding these, quote, weird points of view is a rule because it's not. 
I mean, they're grammatically correct. If you do them correctly, they're not, quote, wrong. Um, so it's not so much a rule as a guideline. But the same thing applies. If you're going to break this guideline, you should be a master. You should be good enough to know the right time and in the right way to break this guideline and to be able to pull it off so well that no one is going to question that you made the right choice. And your reader is going to know what's going on and they're going to be with you every step of the way. They're not going to be confused. They're not going to be annoyed. They're not going to be frustrated. They're not going to be lost. So as I said, I just read Project Hail Mary by Andy Weir. And this book breaks this guideline. Actually, it breaks a couple guidelines. First of all, it uses first person present tense. So first person isn't a weird point of view, but present tense is a weird tense. But it also breaks another guideline that I haven't even mentioned yet, which is that in general, whatever point of view you choose for your book, you should stick with it for the entire book. So if you decide you're going to write in first person present tense, for instance, then the whole book should be in first person present tense. That is the general guideline. So, okay, real quick, I just want to say again, I am not going to spoil this book because I love this book. I want you to love this book and enjoy it as much as I did. So you're in a safe place here. I'm not going to spoil it. I am not going to tell you anything about this book beyond what you would learn by reading the inside flap of the hardcover, or I presume the back of the paperback when the paperback comes out. So you know how on the, the back of a paperback or the inside flap of a hardback, it kind of gives you a little tease about the book and tells you a little bit about what the book's about. I won't tell you any more than that. I'm not even going to tell you all of that. Um, but, but there's nothing I'm going to say as far as the plot or what's happening in the book that you wouldn't learn by reading that little blurb on the back of the book. All right. So as I said, this book uses first person, present tense, but it also uses first person, past tense. So it's breaking one guideline in that it's using present tense. It's breaking another guideline in that it's using two different tenses and switching between them. However, it was the right choice and it works really well. So I thought after this whole, you know, spiel about you shouldn't do this, Again, reminding us that someone who's really good can break these rules and it can be the right choice. And, and now I'm going to give you an example of a story that does exactly that. It breaks these guidelines and it's better for it. So again, in general, first person present isn't necessarily the best choice for your novel. And in general, switching between two tenses, present and past, isn't the best choice for your novel. However, this is an example where breaking the rules or the guidelines was the right thing to do. It's immediately obvious, or at least it was immediately obvious to me reading the book, why the two tenses were used. And although these aren't my favorite point of views and tenses, I think they were the right choice. So this is coming from someone who in general doesn't care for first person and in general de definitely doesn't care for present tense. And I'm sitting here telling you, I think it was the right choice to do that. And I think it made the book better that it was written that way. So I was kind of a hostile witness or whatever, right? It, it, if this book can win me over, it definitely could win over someone who prefers first person. Of course, it helps that the book is well written. It's very clear. There's never confusion about what's going on because it's well written. You can only do something like this if you can do it well, if you can do it very well. Otherwise, you're going to crash and burn and, and the book will suffer for it. So again, no spoilers beyond the little blurb on the back of the book. But the main character begins a story with amnesia and he doesn't remember his name. So immediately, third person limited is not going to work real well for this story. Because if this book were written in third person limited, we would reveal his name to the reader almost immediately. Within the first page, if not the first paragraph, the reader would know this character's name, but the character doesn't know their own name, right? I mean, I guess you could try to write it all with he and never use a name, but that would be really awkward and, and would read like bad writing. So first person is a great choice here because we don't need to give away the character's name when the character doesn't know their own name. 
It's really that simple. The reason first person present is used for most of the book is because there are a lot of flashbacks in the book as the main character's memories start coming back to him in flashes. So first person present is used when we're with the character in the present time, and then first person past is used when we're in a flashback and experiencing something from the, from the character's past. I mean, completely logical, right? So not only does this make perfect sense, it actually helps to orient the reader. So as a reader, you always know whether you're in the present or if you're in a flashback just based on what tense what you're reading is in. So this is a perfect example of a less popular tense, present tense, being used not because the writer is trying to show off or be pretentious or anything like that, but because the story demands it and wouldn't be as well told with a different tense or if he's stuck with the same tense. On top of that, the story is switching back and forth between present and past tense, which is something you'd normally want to avoid doing, but again, it makes sense and it actually makes the book easier for the reader to understand instead of harder. And that's the key. It makes it easier for the reader instead of harder. That's why you know it was the right choice. It's really simple when you think about it. So again, there are basically two reasons why I think this was the right choice to make for this, for this book. Number one, the story itself demands it or at least suggests it and is better told in these points of view in these tenses. Even though the first person present point of view is not as common and switching between tenses is normally not done, it actually makes the story easier to understand for the reader. And this is really key. For instance, one of the things that this allows the writer to do in this story is he can and does begin a chapter that's a flashback. Normally, you would need some kind of transition at the beginning of the chapter to let the reader know that we're now going into a flashback. And those transitions can be kind of awkward, and they can really be awkward, especially at the beginning of a chapter. But because he's using the change in tense to let us know that we're in a flashback, he doesn't have to do a transition. So he can start a chapter right in the middle of a flashback, even though at the end of the last chapter we were in the present. And we know what's going on because the change to the past tense is telling us that we're in a flashback now. He doesn't have to do some kind of weird, awkward transition. You know, the doodaloo, doodaloo, doodaloo. He doesn't have to do that at the beginning of the chapter because the change in tense is enough to let us know what's going on. So not only is he able to let us know right at the beginning of a new chapter that, okay, you're in a flashback now, even though you were just in the present. What's most elegant and amazing and awesome about this is he is able to do that without adding one single word to the book. He doesn't need to write a short little transition scene or anything like that. It doesn't take any other words to do it. All he has to do is change the tense of the verbs he's using and it conveys that without adding any words to the story, without adding any complexity to it, without making it any harder to understand, or without having to break his rhythm or flow or anything like that. So that's the first reason it was the right choice, because it really serves the story. It really does. It makes it easier to understand and allows him to make these transitions without having to add in a bunch of segues and whatnot. The second reason that it was the right choice is that the author is able to do it well and pull it off well and does not make any mistakes doing it. I mean, this book from the very beginning sucked me in in a way that a book hasn't done for a long, long time. In fact, it's been so long. I can't even remember the last time I, I read a book that I was this um, engaged with. I can see why it's so highly recommended by, by so many people. Now, if he wasn't consistent in the way he did this, if he was making mistakes here and there that the editors didn't catch and have him fix, it would have been super confusing. But he is consistent. He makes no mistakes. So it actually makes it easier to understand and it makes it more immersive. And again, that's really the key. It really comes down to the reader and their experience. Does this choice improve their experience? Does it make it easier to understand? Does it make them more immersed in the story or does it do the opposite? 
So, you know, this wasn't done to show off or to seem artsy or try to, quote, elevate (laughs) the story or any nonsense like that. It actually facilitates the reader's understanding of the story, and it always keeps the reader grounded. So the reader always knows if they're in the present of the story or if they're in the past of the story in a flashback. And that's how you do it right. So again, if if you're starting a story or a book or whatever, and you're you're trying to decide between two possible points of view or two possible tenses, and if you know, they seem equally good to the story to you, um, then I would recommend going with the more common one, the one that your readers are more used to. And again, that that depends a bit on your genre. So, you know, think about the genre you're writing. So if you're writing YA, then first person's probably the better choice. If you're writing adult, then third person's probably the better choice. And And it may even differ depending on are you writing fantasy or urban fantasy or sci-fi or or what. The less possible barriers there are between the reader and their enjoyment of the story and their immersion in it, the better. And also remember here, not all readers are the same. You know, all your readers don't have English degrees. All your readers didn't go to college, you know. So so keep that in mind too. You know, it's easy to, to think every reader's like me and be like, well, I could handle this. You know, this wouldn't wouldn't bother me, but it's like, well, you're not every reader. What about, you know, think about the lowest common denominator of who you want reading your book. How would they feel about it? Would it confuse them? So here's the bottom line. The primary goal of a writer of fiction, at least, is to tell a good story. This requires a certain humility. Again, the goal here isn't to show off. Good prose is invisible. When faced with a decision like which point of view to use for a story, think about the reader. Think about their experience. How can you best tell the story to the reader? How can you help the reader in every possible way so they aren't confused? Every time a reader is confused, they lose immersion in your story. Keep your eyes on the reader's experience. Let that be your guiding light and you won't go wrong. I think about, and Stephen King talked about this a little bit on in On Writing, and he was himself quoting another author in another book that I unfortunately don't remember. But I remember him talking in there about how, you know, the, the this particular author that he was talking about, that he got this from, felt that, that the reader's often in a lot of trouble, like someone drowning in quicksand. And anything you can do as a writer to throw them a rope to help them out, you should do. So, you know, the inverse of that is true as well, right? Anything you as a writer could do to make it more difficult for the reader to get out of that quicksand, you should not do. So, yeah, I mean, for me, that's really the key. And and when I face decisions like these, that's how I look at it. I'm like, am, am I wanting to do this thing to for the gratification of my own ego to prove to myself or someone else that I can do it or or to show off or to show everybody how smart I am or what a masterful wordsmith I am? Or am I doing this to better the experience for the reader? And the, the second reason is is by far the better reason. So yeah, keep that in mind and and you won't go wrong. All right. Wow. Actually, that did not take as long as I thought. (laughs) That actually went pretty well. I I don't think this episode is going to be insanely long. So yeah, I'm I'm a little iffy about this, to be honest. Um, You know, I, I say again and again on this show, I'm not here to teach. There are plenty of people that are better qualified to teach you about writing than me. For instance, Stephen King, go learn from him, go read on writing. Um, he's got a lot more experience and knowledge than I do, but for the most part, unless you're talking about maybe some specific genres or lack of genres, I don't think anything I've said here today is controversial. I think this is stuff that most writers would agree with. So I feel like I'm on pretty solid ground and yeah, I, I thought this was the perfect time to talk about this because I was thinking about talking about, you know, tense and point of view anyway. And I just read this book that that did it so well, you know, that used two points of view I'm not a fan of, 
and uh, switch between them, which I'm usually not a fan of, but it did it so well. And like I said, by the second chapter, it was clear to me that it was the right choice. You know, there's another book I read in recent memory. It's been a while, but it's recent enough. I still remember it. Um, that used one of these weird points of view. And that was not the case. I found myself wondering for, I think at least the first half of the book, why on earth the writer chose this point of view and why on earth the editor okayed it. Um, because it could have easily been told in third person limited and would have been as good, probably better. Um, but instead the writer chose this really weird point of view. And then there was a moment somewhere around halfway through the book, I think, where I thought, oh, I see here now why the writer chose this weird point of view. And it started to make sense, but that was for like a chapter and then it was over and it, it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't, you know, it was like to make maybe that one chapter, you know, add it a little tiny, tiny, tiny infinitesimal little bit of something uh, was not worth undermining the entire rest of the book, in my opinion. And also that, you know, the writer didn't pull it off great. I mean, I don't recall there being any flat out mistakes. You know, they didn't make any mistakes, but it wasn't masterfully done. So in my mind, that book failed on both counts. It, the weird point of view did not improve the story. The weird point of view could have been told in third person limited or first person and been just as good, probably better. And the writer wasn't masterful at it. They didn't do it very well. They did it okay. It was, it was okay. So, you know, you can write third person limited okay and get by. You can write first person okay and get by. But if you're going to do something weird, uh, it's got to be a lot better than okay. So, yeah, I'm curious if any of you read like literary fiction and I mean current day literary fiction, not like the old classics, which I've read those. But I'm, I'm curious what, what your experience is if, if a lot of that's in these weird tenses and if you feel like it's usually warranted and, and makes the story better or if a lot of times it's not or if it's 50 50 or what because I don't really read that stuff these days so I don't know but from hearing people talk about it it seems like you're more likely to see something like that in in, in those kinds of uh, books and I'm just curious you know if that's the case is it well done or or not so much you know, where, where I do see these weird things a lot are in short stories. So if you read, you know, one of the short story magazines like Fantasy and Science Fiction or Asimov's or something like that, um, for whatever reason, I don't know why, um, you will see quite a few short stories in those kinds of things that are in these weird tenses. And I almost never like them. And I almost never think it was the right choice or the best choice so it really makes me wonder why people are writing things these way, ways and why editors are publishing them those ways. I don't know. I mean, if I had to guess, I mean, it's dangerous to guess why people do what they do. But if I had to guess, I, I think that at least for some writers, it's just to do something different. You know, you read a lot, a lot of books your whole life. And, you know, most of them are either in third person limited or first person and, I, I could see getting to a point where you just get sick of those and you want to do something different to stand out. But I don't know. I guess it comes down to why you're doing what you're doing, you know? And I think this is true for any kind of art, you know, whether you're talking about writing or music or painting or whatever. It's like, are you doing what you're doing just to express yourself or just to do whatever you feel like doing or are you doing what you're doing because you want people to experience it? You know, so I'll talk about writing. That's what I know the most about. Am, am I writing because I just, I just have these stories inside of me that have to get out and I just want to write for writing's sake? Or am I writing because I want to tell stories that people want to read? You know, so depending on what your primary motivation is, you know, that's going to change your approach, Right. If I'm writing just for my own benefit and I don't care if anybody else likes it or I don't care if anybody else wants to read it or, you know, is, wants to print it, then, you know, yeah, I can write in whatever point of view I want. It doesn't matter. But if my goal as a writer is to write 
stories that people read and enjoy and tell their friends about and then their friends read it and enjoy it, then yeah, this stuff does matter. And it should be a consideration. And and again, you know, you can break any of these rules or any of these guidelines. And, you know, you can think of really great stories that have done so. I just talked about one, Project Hail Mary. Um, and there are even ones that are even more, I mean, Project Hail Mary isn't that out there. Going between first person, past and present isn't, isn't that weird, really. Um, there's probably, I'm, I'll probably get comments from people with plenty of other Um, popular novels that have done it you know it's not that weird but you know i'm sure you can find examples of fantastic stories told in second person or told in future tense that are just fantastic so again someone who's really good they can break these rules they can break these guidelines and they can make it work but that's not all of us that's not me i mean i'll just be honest i can't talk about anyone else but i can talk about myself i'm not that good I'm I'm not, I, I don't think I'm nearly good enough a writer that I could pull off a future tense or second person and make it better than it would have been in third person limited or even first person. I mean, I'm not even a good, I don't even know if I'm a good enough writer to write first person well. If only because I haven't read that much of it. I'd have to go read a bunch of it first. But even then, I, I don't know. You know, this is my my third novel and the other two were in third person limited. This one's in third person limited. So I I feel like I've got a handle on third person limited and there's still, um, a lot of room for improvement, a lot of room for growth. I'm, I'm no Robert Jordan. My third person limited is doesn't have the depth that his does, which is one of the reasons I'm trying to keep to one point of view character because I feel like as, as a writer, as an artist, if I'm going to have, more than one point of view character in my book, I want them each to have a very distinct voice to where I I don't even have, you know, let's say I've got two characters in my book right now, T and Minji. Well, I have more than two, but the two I've <laughs> written the most about so far, T and Minji. So far, it's all been from Tia's point of view. If I, and, and I have considered adding Minji as a point of view character because I really like the character and I've considered it. I've also considered adding the station AI as a point of view character and could even like that could be an instant where I could do omniscient third person omniscient with the AI because the AI has access to surveillance all over. So, you know, I'm trying to think maybe someone who's read these books more recently can tell me, but I'm thinking maybe ancillary justice used third person omniscient because um, the Justice of Torin, the the main character of that story, um, knew what was like an AI of a ship and knew everything that went on the ship. So I think maybe at least when they were on the ship, it was kind of an omniscient point of view, if I remember right. But it's been a long time since I read that book. I could be wrong. But anyway, that's an instance where omniscient would work and would would make sense and and would be the better choice if you could do it really well. But I don't know if I could, first of all, I don't know if I could do Omniscient really well. I have no idea. Probably not because I haven't read a lot of it recently. But for me to to say, okay, I'm going to add Minji as a point of view character to get back to what I was saying. For me to do that, I personally, I would want to be able to write Tia and Minji so well, their points of view so well, that I could write a chapter from one of their points of view and never use their name, never tell you whose head you're in and not give you any other clues to figure it out, like, you know, their apartment or something. And you would know just from the way they think and the way they talk, you would know, oh, this is Tia or, oh, this is Minji. Like personally, that's the level I think I need to be at. And I don't think I'm there. I don't think I could pull that off. I I think they would be too similar. Um, So, so that's why I I don't want to do it. Now, I feel like maybe I could pull it off with the AI just because by nature of it being an AI, it might help me make that voice more distinct. It'd be in a way easier if that makes sense because it would be so different where T and Minji are both human women. They have a lot more in common than a human woman and an AI do. But uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Now, it's interesting because my last book I wrote, Dawn of Endless Night, had quite a few point of view characters. I had I had quite a few. And, and I did the thing that I've talked about in the past I'm not a fan of these days where I would 
just have a certain chapter in a random point of view that you would, they, they weren't a throwaway character that you never saw usually, but it was like one chapter from this character's point of view. And that's all you get. Um, and I'm not so much a fan of that these days. Um, I think I was trying too hard to be Robert Jordan back then, but, uh, yeah, that book had a lot of points of view and I don't know, maybe I should go back and read it over and see if I feel like the voices are distinct between the different characters. I mean, maybe I did better than I, than I thought I would or thought I did. I don't know. But, but right now I don't have that level of confidence and I'm like, you know what? I'd rather stick with one point of view and really get this one character's voice down. Um, also, the thing is, as soon as you add another point of view character, it it just inherently makes your book longer because now you have to develop that character more, which just adds pages, adds words to your book. And I want this book to be as short and tight as possible while still, you know, telling the story I want to tell. I don't want it to be this bloated doorstop of a book just because it'll be easier to sell if it's not. And also, I just, I'd rather tell tighter stories and tell more of them. You know, if I'm going to write 200,000 words, I'd rather put out two 100,000 word books than one massive 200,000 word books and tell two different stories. Um, but that's just a personal choice of mine or, or a personal opinion. So yeah, you know, y you have to be honest about what, what you're capable of, what you're good at, where your strengths are, where your weaknesses are. And, you know, I'm sure one day I'll write more than one point of view. Um, but right now, you know, you got to crawl before you walk, right? You got to walk before you run. And, you know, right now my goal is to develop my voice as Tia, writing this story from Tia's point of view to the point that when I go back and read any point of view from Dawn of Endless Night, but but let's say the main character, Jeremy, I go read his, points of, his point of view in Dawn of Endless Night my goal is to be able to say, wow, my voice as Tia is very different than my voice as Jeremy was. If I can pull that off and I accomplish that, then the next book, maybe I can handle two points of view and, and make have two very different points of view and two very different voices within the same book. Because again, in, in a third person limited point of view, the narrator is the point of view character. So they should have the same voice. Now, if you're talking omniscient, then the narrator can have their own voice that's different from all the characters, which which I feel like that's even more difficult to do. And an example of that is actually in The Wheel of Time. If you've read The Wheel of Time, if you've read any of the books, you'll recall each book has a prologue, but then when you get through the prologue and you begin chapter one, every single book begins with this little uh, device he uses about a wind. A wind rises somewhere and we follow the wind as it travels across the landscape and we see various things happening. That's an omniscient point of view. So he will go into third person omniscient just for that section of the first chapter of every book. And then boom, we're back into third person limited for the rest of it. And, and I think he pulls that off where those omniscient sections do have a different voice than any of the individual characters do. But, you know, that's that's a challenging thing to do. I don't think I'm ready for that yet. So, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm trying really hard to write this book from one point of view. And so far, I've been able to do it. I, I think sometimes changing point of views can, be, can become a crutch. You know, it, it's when, when you think of a given scene, your first thought is, oh, I should tell the scene from this character's point of view, even though you you haven't established them as a point of view character. And sometimes that's just the easy first answer that comes to you. And if you think longer and harder, you can come up with a way to tell the scene well from a point of view character you've already established. But I think sometimes it's just too easy just to be like, okay, I'll use this throwaway character for this one scene because that's the thing that occurred to me. And, you know, I think sometimes you can dig a little deeper and find a way to do it with with what you've already established but you know that's just that's just my opinion that is not a uh based on anything but just my own likes and, and dislikes so yeah there there's our discussion on points of view let me know what you think and also you know what if you know of a 
book or a story that's written in a less common point of view and or tense that you think is really good and you think uh, that was the right choice for that story, let us know. Let us know in the Discord in the books channel, the book discussion channel, or um, if for some reason you you don't want to be in the Discord, <laughs> you could email that to me and uh, maybe I can share some of those in, in a future episode or, or put them in the show notes or something. Uh, for those of you that maybe want to explore reading some things in these different points of view, because maybe you've never read anything in second person before. Um, other than that, you know, one thing you could do is is try one of these these fiction magazines like uh, Fantasy and Science Fiction Magazine or Asimov's or Analog or Clark's World or Lightspeed, um, things like that. A lot of times they'll have stories in, in some of the less common points of view but it may or may not be that great. It's kind of hit or miss with with those magazines, with their stories. So, you know, it'd be much better if someone could recommend, hey, here's a story in, say, second person past that's really good, and I think it was the right choice. Um, that'd be a, a more efficient way to find a good example than, than just reading a bunch of stuff and trying to find something that's good. Um, because, yeah, like I said, in my experience, a lot of that stuff that's done that way, it's not really... It's not really that great, in my opinion. Um, but your mileage may vary. So uh, if you would like to get a hold of me, you can email me at lexoutloudpodcast at gmail.com. You can also call our voicemail, 951-465-5391, and leave a message. Please join our community on Discord. You can find a link to that in the show notes at lexstarwalker.com slash LOL. And finally, I want to send a huge shout out and thank you to all the patrons who support the show and um, support what I'm doing. Really appreciate all the patrons. And, you know, if you dig the show or if you want to support what I'm up to, uh, becoming a patron is a great way to do so. But it's not the only way. I have a whole support page on the website uh, that lists all kinds of ways that, that you can help me out and, and help support what I'm doing other than becoming a patron, if uh, you'd want to do something else. And uh, you can find a link to that in the show notes as well, as well at lexstarwalker.com slash LOL. All right, so that's going to wrap it up for me again uh, for Lex Out Loud. And uh, next time I talk to you, I will be a year older and will have completed yet another lap around the sun. So uh, yeah, here's to a, another year of the show. And uh, hopefully by this time next year, I'm well into the editing process, if not done with it. I mean, my God, by this time next year, I really hope I'm done editing and I'm trying to find an agent. I really hope. Um, but we'll see. It's kind of hard to predict these things, how long they, how long they take. So uh, n- next week, I believe we're going to be back to the writing group discussions and we're going to have a couple episodes on tips for being good at giving critiques and tips for being good at receiving critiques because there are definitely some best practices for for both sides of that relationship that uh, it's best if everybody in the group adheres to. So so we'll talk about some of that stuff. So uh, yeah, we'll be back soon uh, for that. And until then, keep writing. <laughs>